Oh, man, we talk about cancel culture a lot because it's real and it's all over the place. What does it really, what does it mean? What's it like? What happens as a result of cancel culture? Who gets targeted? We, this is an ongoing discussion. I can't give you all the answers right now. But here's, here's a perfect case in point. A guy named Thomas Bosco, who owns the Indian Road Cafe in Manhattan, is uh, coming under fire. This is a story by David Marcus, uh, or it's an opinion piece by David Marcus in the New York Post. So here's what happened. Uh, this guy, Bosco, in May, went on MSNBC. Well, that's, his first, that's his first mistake. You, know, you, can't, you can't go on these lib propaganda outlets unless you're, unless you're going to be a lib that bends the knee and does everything they want you to do. If you're expecting fair treatment, if you're expecting people to... Be open-minded to your point of view. You will be sorely mistaken. Uh, and unfortunately, this guy, is, he's a civilian. He's not a media guy. And so he went on TV and figured I, I could just talk to people. Here's, how, the, here's what, uh, how David Marcus describes it. In May, Bosco went on MSNBC to discuss the devastating economic impact of the coronavirus lockdowns on his business. When asked by host Ari Melber how he graded Trump's performance during the pandemic, Bosco indicated that while mistakes were made, he still supports the president. Bosco added that he also supports Governor Andrew, Andrew Cuomo and Mayor Bill de Blasio. And then at this point, Melbourne, for God knows what reason, asked Bosco if he had voted for Trump and would he again? The answer to both questions was yes. And that is all it took. The backlash was swift, according to The New York Times. Uh, one member of the mob egging on the destruction of the man's livelihood and his employees was Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers. She wrote, it's hard to ever go back. Can't ever go back to this guy's restaurant in Inwood, huh? Because he said he's a Trump voter. So now, now just, just remember this. When people, because there, there is a movement right now, there is a movement right now of leftists who are trying to say that there is no cancel culture that cancel culture is a fiction of uh, conservative paranoia or something. So that, that's already happening. That's already out there. And so then when there are cases like this of the most egregious kinds of cancel culture, uh, they'll, they'll, make one of, they'll do one of two things, either ignore it or they'll say, well, this person really deserved it. I think in this case, it's pretty clear that no reasonable sane person could argue that this is what should happen. Although there are a lot of unreasonable, insane Democrats running around. So now he has been uh, targeted by the left and they, they want to ruin this guy. And, and they're, they're calling for a boycott of his restaurant just because he's a Trump voter. So if you say that you voted for Donald Trump and people find out the, the America that liberals want to work and want to be and want to live in, and have created largely for all of us already, is if you say that, they will feel comfortable ruining your life, bankrupting your business, making it so you can't feed your family, so your employees, who I'm sure are probably all Biden, would-be Biden voters and Hillary voters, right? Uh, work in the restaurant business, a lot of Democrats, a lot of, gonna be a lot of Democrats there. But this is the country that they want us all to, uh, to live in. And this is how things are shaking out right now. So I, I think we should see this for what it is. It is a totalitarianism. It's, it's wrong. And until we band together and say enough, it's going to keep happening. Until the culture changes and we go back to a place where you can say to somebody, yeah, I don't agree with what you said, but I'm just going to go on living my life. Libs can't handle that anymore. Makes me feel unsafe. Your ideas makes me feel unsafe. That's what they like to say. That's what they like to do. And uh, it's so intellectually and, and, and morally bankrupt, this, this approach that they've taken. But this is widespread. You know, that was what the writer at Vox, you know, that far left website, I mean, probably the, like the most progressive trash heap in many ways online. I mean, it's, 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 it's comedy without trying to be. That's how left wing it is. I mean, you, you read the headlines constantly on Vox.com and you'll think, is this, 
Is this the uh, Babylon B making fun of making fun of liberals? No, it's actually that's that's who they are. That's what they are all about. And uh, you had a writer say that because this guy, Matty Iglesias, who is a far left wing progressive, but he did sign his name to that letter saying, hey, can we start to protect open debate and discussion? Another writer at Vox came out and said that she felt unsafe because her colleague signed a letter saying that people should be allowed to disagree. These people are supposed to be journalists. They're supposed to believe and and not just believe in, but defend the free expression of ideas. They're supposed to think that this is central to their position. And then there was an additional, you know how there was that letter that I mentioned that Matty Iglesias and other people, you know, Salman Rushdie and uh, David Frum and I don't know, all these other people, many of whom really aren't worth reading or hearing from. But, you know, they all signed this thing saying uh, we should have open debate. Now there's a letter in response to it, a letter on justice and open debate. And this is from theobjective.com. A more specific letter on justice and open debate, they're calling it. And it's all about how open debate is actually bad, and here's why. Open, free, free exchange of ideas is bad, and here's why. And it's signed by all of these journalists from HuffPost, CNN, New York Times, NBC, all these different places. And we wonder, we wonder why we have the media that we do. It was really a reminder as you read through it that our media is full of, and I mean this, journalists are generally dumb. They're, they're really the dumbest people in, and, you know, for, for a profession that prides itself on having really smart people, the disparity between the reality of the stupidity of the people in the profession versus their perception of themselves I think there's a bigger gulf, a wider gulf for journalists than any, any other profession that exists. I really, I really believe that. So this letter is a perfect example. of. And then you have the uh, Goya CEO of Goya Beans, I think. I don't know what else. They, is it, they do other things, Bruce and Mark, than beans? Yeah, all types of Spanish food products. A lot of Spanish. Okay. A lot, I just know of it as Goya Beans. I, I don't know. There's a, okay. But other Spanish food products. Uh, as well, he went to a Hispanic um, like jobs speech thing that the White House did, you know, promoting Hispanic entrepreneurship and good things. And, and he just said, you know, I appreciate the leadership the president has shown. But if, if you're a Hispanic CEO and you show up and say you like President Trump, people will stop eating. Libs will stop eating your food. That's where we are now. They're, they're, these, they're absurd. They're, they're deranged. I mean, they really have emotional... Liberals have widespread emotional problems. They think it's politics, but really they've got, uh, they've got a lot of undiagnosed or hidden mental illness that is driving their politics. Or maybe their politics has made them have a problem where they're mentally ill, they have a hysteria, they have a mania, they have... That's what's happened. We're dealing with this now across the country. I know I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but you don't have to be to see that this is a mass hysteria and these people are completely nuts. All right, Freestyle Friday is upon us, which means, uh, Producer Mark, all of your hard work this week, staying up late, taking copious notes on the various voicemails that are called in for us, we can now actually hear some of them, correct? Yes. Yes, we can. If you want to leave some for next week, folks, 844-900-2825. 844-900-BUCK. Producer Mark, play that funky music. I'm sorry. Did you mean to play the music or to play the... No, of course. I mean, play the, 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 the you know, the voicemail. The, the message. Okay. Yes. You have to be more specific, Buck. Hey, Buck and Producer Mark. This is Pat from Lancaster, PA. Hey. The governors in the Democratic states and other people as well are following a science, and it's called science fiction because we know the virus cannot be filtered. A submicroscopic virus can't be filtered by almost every mask. We know that. So it's, it's science, but it's science fiction. I hope you keep mentioning that or use that in your uh, 
talk if you think so. The other thing is, you, did you look up Elmer Fudd yet? Because you're so good at doing certain voices. I thought an Elmer Fudd voice would you'd be excellent at. So I'm hoping you can do that sometime. Thanks. Bye. Well, thank you, sir, for your voicemail. And yes, there's there's actual science to show that the penetration of fabric masks by aerosolized virus is very, very high. I've even seen one study suggest it's as high as 97%. So, yeah, you're getting about a 3%. Yeah, wear that mask. 3% protection from viral, uh, from virus, you know, getting into your mouth, basically. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that that's the established number, but it's not super high. If all we had to do was wear masks... You would have enclaves of this country with no coronavirus because people wear masks all the time. It's not nearly as effective as people think, and it may be almost entirely ineffective against this virus. We will find out. But in the meantime, people act like the science is settled. And as for Elmer Fudd, uh, is that is that I I, I taught I taught a putty cat? Is that is that Elmer Fudd? No, I believe so. I think that is. Is that I, I told I told a putty cat? Yeah, I, I have to. I, I don't know. I don't have Elmer Fudd in my head, so I'd have to think a little bit more about it. And then there's, isn't there that guy, Foghorn Leg, going, I said, I said, uh, that, that guy, right? Yeah, he's, uh, they're, they're all Looney Tunes. Producer, producer Nick is weighing in. What's he, what's he telling me here? Oh, that's Tweety Bird. No, <laughs> my bad's not Elmer Fudd. That's Tweety Bird. Whoops. Whoops. Yeah, I definitely, I don't, oh, I don't, yeah, that is. Oh. Yeah. I got to figure this stuff out. All right, next, next one from our voicemails. Hit it. Hey, producer Mark. Hey, Buck. Phil the Brit here from St. Augustine, Florida. Love the show. Two quick questions. So the original Saturday show, was it only two hours long? Am I remembering that correctly? And the second question is around asymptomatic people. They're relatively young, the main part of our workforce. With all the testing, testing, testing that we hear about, Do we know what percentage of the workforce are asymptomatic? And when do they stop being contagious? We need to get past this fear-mongering that we have and get our economy going again. Thanks, Buck. Shields high. Shields high, my friend. Cool accent, too. I always like when we get cool accents. Um, The second question you asked about asymptomatic workforce, I'll deal with that first. I, I believe we don't know. The estimates are that up to 20 times the number of established tested cases in any given day. Uh, So if you, if you, for every person you test in an area who comes up positive, they think 10 to 20 times that number are actually positive with the case at that, with, with the virus at that time, asymptomatic cases. I just think there's no really good. There's really no good estimates of how many people out there in the workforce uh, right now have it. Uh, And Mark, what was his second question? His original question was about the original Saturday Squad show. How long was it? Oh, the original OSS, the original Saturday Squad show was three hours, and it was, from, it was on Saturdays from 12 to 3 Eastern p.m., and that's when we started, and we had like a handful of people listening, and then we grew it and grew it and grew it. That's actually a, um, a, a moment here where I actually want to transition for a second, and we'll get back to the voicemails. Um, I saw today that... Uh, Jay Severin had passed away, and I, I wanted to take a moment just to say that uh, we should all, those of us who, who knew him and, and anybody uh, in general, should uh, send thoughts and prayers to his family. Uh, I knew Jay a bit from working with him there, and I got to tell you, I, I'm, I was really sad. He was only 69. I'm really sad to hear about I think it was cancer. It wasn't from COVID. Uh, he, he, was a, he was a good guy. Uh, I didn't know him super well, but... I really just knew him professionally. He was a radio, he was a radio host, radio host. Uh, he was really interesting, and, and he had stuff to say. And I always appreciated it when we had the Man in the Moon festival in Salt Lake City with Glenn, I don't know now, maybe seven, six, seven years ago. Uh, I, I spent some time in a car, took kind of a long ride with just Jay Severin and me. And we talked so much about the radio business and we hung out, we hung out for hours that day. And I always remembered one, um, he, he went through all the radio hosts that you would know and gave me his just sort of professional assessment of who's good at what, who's really talented, who's really lucky, who's really nasty. Uh, and 
I thought he was spot on. <laughs> so, so that's, uh, you know, the only one I'll say out loud is he says Rush is the greatest uh, that's ever done the, and Rush is the greatest radio host to have, to have yet lived. Um, and I agree with him on that. I won't tell you about the rest of them because I don't want to cause any problems. Uh, but he also was very encouraging to me and said that he had not really come across, well, you know, he said he hadn't come across anybody who was so young, who got so good so fast at radio, which I thought was a very nice thing to say. So I, I, and I appreciated that. And that was really encouraging to me early on in my career. And Jay wasn't the kind of guy, for those of you who ever listened to him and knew him as a host, he was like an uh, say what's on his mind, no BS kind of a guy, but uh, he, he had some very nice things to say about my ability as a radio host when I was just really getting started. You know, it was before I had filled in for Rush and before I had gotten syndicated and everything else. So I always appreciated that. And I'm sorry to hear that he passed. And uh, I know a lot of people spent a lot of time listening to Jay. So, okay. Now let's, uh, let's get back into our voicemails. Producer Mark, what's up next? Hey, Buck. Producer Mark, this is Rob from Wisconsin. Wanted to let you know I've been listening to your show since back to the Blaze days and love everything you're doing for us and the cause, the conservative cause. Basically, I just wanted to say that until we start wrapping up some of this rioting and the breaking of the law, really we don't have a move forward. I agree with you on the wartime conservatism. I think it's time for us to put a foot down and stop the madness. Anyway, keep up the good fight. Love your show. Take care. Shields high. Shields high. Thank you so much for the call. I appreciate ever, all of your sentiments there, and, uh, and I, I agree with you. And I think that we, we all in our own way need to figure out how we can be a part of the fight or at least support those who are fighting. Next voice, Bill Mark. Hi, Buck and Mark. My name is Kevin. I'm part of your millennial constituency out here in a suburb of Denver. And I discovered your show last summer when it started airing here on 93.7. And I think you're a terrific host. Uh, you have a fantastic sense of humor. And I absolutely love listening to you. So, and Mark, you got to get stop getting down on yourself, man. We, uh, we love you just as much as Buck. Shield high. You're both great Americans. Thanks for what you do. That's such a kind, that's so, such a kind email. I mean, email, a uh, voicemail. And I always appreciate when one of producer Mark's extended family members calls in like that, you know, ah. so, you know, a- apparently from the Denver area, there's like a second cousin, Mark. You know, he did make one big mistake. What's that? I'm not just as good as Buck. I'm much better. <laughs> there, there, exa- there you go. There, you know, you, you know, you, you, when you see him at Thanksgiving this year, yeah. you got to give him a He tough- went off the script. Yeah, he went off the script a little bit. But no, no. Hey, I'm so glad that we have our... our Look, we have a we have a very large and and loyal and and fantastic listenership in the Denver area on ninety three at Freedom ninety three seven, and we're very thankful for it. So all of you listening out there, we even had a, a, a would be soon to be congressman from your state today, just because we love Denver so much. All right, Mark, how many more uh, voicemails we got? Got uh, four more. Oh, all right. Well, let's rack them and stack them. Next, please. Hey, Buck. It's John from Mount Airy, Maryland. Hey, uh, just FYI, the reason that the left is so adamant about keeping kids out of school is for the mail-in vote. Uh, if kids can't be in school, then schools are shut down, then voting is basically shut down. 80% of voting happens out of the schools. So uh, they can push their mail-it-in agenda. And uh, if they're anywhere they're going to cheat, that's it right there. Um, these folks have zero integrity, zero morals. So uh, thanks for your show. Love it. Bye. John, thanks so much for calling in. And I, uh, I had not thought about that. I'll be honest. You're introducing something new into the conversation for me. I hadn't thought about shutting down schools as part of the strategy to get voting in the uh, voting to be mail-in in st- instead of going through schools. But I, I suppose that is, that is the case. Uh, yeah, because I vote, uh, my voting district here is a public school, so that makes sense. Yeah. I guess people do use the public schools to do this stuff, right? Producer Mark, do you know, do you know what you're, of course you're registered even though you moved. We know that, because Producer yes. Mark wouldn't forget. He wouldn't forget as part of the best political radio show in the country to register in a critical election year. 
well, the DMV in New Jersey hasn't been open since I moved to New Jersey, so it's been a bit difficult. But uh, I don't know where my New Jersey one, but my New York one was always in a public school. Always in public school, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, I also, I think I have to get one of those upgraded licenses so I can fly on planes again using your driver's license, you know, domestically. What am I supposed I to do that? they delayed the, that because of COVID. Oh, they did delay. Way, oh, okay. As long as you have your passport, you're okay. Okay. You just have to bring your passport with you. Uh, oh, you got to bring your passport with you. Mm, okay, well, it's kind of annoying. <laughs> I don't really want to bring my passport with me when I get, if I'm you flying. If I'm going to Cleveland, I need a passport. I mean, I know things get a little crazy in Ohio sometimes, but. I'd rather, uh, rather than go to, and wait online at the DMV, I'd rather bring my passport to the airport. Oh, I guess that's, that's, certainly, that's certainly one approach, one way to go. You know what I'm, I'm mad about, Producer Mark? I wanted to do, as a perfect weekend for it, I want to watch... There's a Tom Hanks submarine. It's called uh, Greyhound, a submarine movie. If you have Apple TV app on, you can do it. My TV is the model of the TV before what's compatible with Apple TV. So on this rainy ass depressing weekend, when a submarine movie with Tom Hanks would be just what the doctor ordered. I actually the only way you can watch this is on Apple TV. Do you have Apple TV? Or the app? You mean like the Apple TV app? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it shouldn't be compatible with most TVs. Mine's too old. I don't think that's true. Yeah, it is. Mine's from 20... 20- you don't have a Roku or something? Mine's from 2016. No, no. And also, no. you need a subscription to Apple TV. You know that, right? Yeah, but you could get the free subscription, watch the oh, Greyhound yeah. movie, and then... So what well, I'm trying to... you know to- what? I'll, I'll give you a life hack. Since your TV's too old, you do it on your computer and plug it into the TV. Ooh. That yeah. might work. Producer Mark, golf golf clap for producer Mark. Well done. I hadn't thought. I'm good about with it. the tech stuff occasionally. Yeah, that's true. I had not thought about that. Yeah, producer Mark is like MacGyver, only grumpier, and doesn't have a mullet. You do not have a mullet, that's for sure. And oh, actually, yeah, I do. you, you could. Seen me in a I don't know. Maybe <laughs> you with the mullet. But if that happens, we want selfies and we want it spread far and wide. Okay. I don't Just, think my hair can grow that long. Oh, man. I think anyone could. I think if you've got hair, you could pull off a mullet. You know what I mean? As long as it grows in anywhere. But my hair is thinning. Like, I know I'm going to be bald in five years. I'm aware. So I don't think it can go that long. I mean, maybe I could, maybe I could try to bring back, like, achy, breaky heart style mullet. Like, the real deal, you know? I'd watch it. Yeah. I'd like exa- to see it. Yeah. Exactly. Um... Okay, uh, let's go now to, where's, where are we next on this one? Oh, yeah, next. voicemail. Hit it. Hey, Buck, this is Diane from Alabama. Um, I'm hoping President Trump will get reelected, but my main concern is what about the House and the Senate? If we lose those or don't gain enough, will the president be sort of uh, locked down like he has been the last four years? Just want to get thoughts on that. Thanks. Love the show. Bye. Well, Diane from Alabama, thank you so much for calling in and for your kind uh, voicemail. And, and yeah, no, you, you raise a very good point. If we, even if Trump does win, which will be amazing, um, I, uh, even if Trump does win, it seems to me that the House and the Senate, if they both go against Trump, we got we got big problems. Remember, if they had the votes, they would have re- if they had the votes and it would have had to be a two thirds majority, but they would have removed this president from office. Now, you might say, well, thankfully, the founders were genius enough to foresee this and and make it so it's really hard through just pure partisan rancor to remove a president through the impeachment process. It's got to be very clear and uh, remember, it's impeachment and right impeachment of the House, removal in the Senate. Uh, but if they even have control of the Senate, so they can have control of committees, they'll they'll ju- they'll just drown the Trump administration in the second term in lawsuits. They'll just it'll just that's all. Look, look what they did the first term. This is the way that they do things. They don't make better arguments. They don't have they don't inspire people. They just lie and are vicious and undermine and use lawfare. So you're, you raise a very valid point, a very real concern, which is what happens if he wins the presidency, but you've got both the, the, the uh, House of Representatives and the Senate against him. It's going to be a dogfight is what it means. It's going to be a dogfight. 
Uh, so what do we have here next? Uh, we got one more, right? Two more. Here oh, we go. wow. Very, look at producer Mark Spent burning the midnight oil on. to make sure we got a lot of voicemails. Look at you, sir. Hi, Buck. It's Joanne from New Jersey. I had a thought. What if we eliminated the national anthem from all professional sports games? It would do away with a lot of angst and rob them of the opportunity to disrespect this country and our flag. So it's so far removed from what it started out that it has no meaning for these people anyway. So let's just do without it. Take care. Well, Suzanne from New Jersey, thanks for calling in. I, yeah, I mean, I'm, if, if they're uh, going to do what I think they're going to do where they start having, and I had, Producer Mark, had you ever heard of the, the they, I believe they call it the Black, what is it, the Black National Anthem? Yes, I think the NFL has said they're going to play that at the beginning of week one games. I had never heard of this before. I had never either, yeah. Okay, so there's a, there's a black national anthem, apparently. I did not, I'm being serious, I'd never heard of it before. Uh, if they're going to do things like that uh, in professional sports, yeah, one, I, I'm going to have a very hard time watching any professional sports because the, a huge part of the appeal of sports for me is the escape from the politics and if they're going to play politics with this and the kneeling and everything else. Um, but you know, Diane, the, the thing about what, what, or Susan rather, sorry, Diane was before Susan, the issue with what you're saying is that they'll do, I think what they want to do. The leagues will do what they want to do. So it's not like they get government permission for the um, uh, government permission to do the national anthem. But I would say this, I think that there should certainly be a rethink of, you know, military flyovers at NFL games and, you know, honor guards and Marines uh, from the honor guard, you know, all, I, I don't know. They should be showing up at these professional sporting events anymore. You know, the NFL has worked very hard to create this perception of it as America's game and particularly using a lot of support for the troops and a lot of, a lot of military. And, and I love that. I mean, that that's all great. But you, know, you can't do that and have like disrespect to the flag at the beginning of the game and people coming up with different anthems than the national anthem and so on and so forth. Producer Mark, what do you think? Uh, I mean, the NFL, last time this happened, they a lot of teams just didn't come out for the national anthem. It was played and the team stayed in the locker room. Um, I think, I mean, in hockey, I've always liked it. There's been some national anthems at the garden where the stadium's rocking, everyone's singing along. I, I can go either way. Like, I would miss it sometimes, like in a playoff atmosphere, but I re wouldn't really miss it on an everyday game. Like, what's the difference? Just play sports. Yeah, I just, I, I just wish professional leagues would be about sports, but that's very, it's apparently too much to ask these days. All right, producer Mark, next one. Hit it. Hey, Chris from Spokane, Washington. So I just wanted to thank you for being straightforward and honest about uh, what you talk about. <clears throat> There's other talk show hosts who unnecessarily belittle and demean uh, other people. And I don't necessarily agree with that. Even if you don't agree with them, even if you don't like them, it doesn't do any good to belittle and demean and demoralize other people. So thank you for what you're doing and being honest and straightforward and to the point. Keep it up. Well... Thank you for calling in from Spokane, Washington. And yes, I, I do not, uh, out of professional jealousy or spite or uh, insecurity, go after other conservatives. Um, I don't do it. You'll know that from listening to my show. Other people do it. Other people do it, especially if they lose in the demo, let's say, for an hour of their show in a major market, somebody who hasn't been in the market all that long. Other people do stuff like that. I don't do stuff like that. Uh, I let the work speak for itself, and I appreciate the time that everyone gives me here uh, by listening to me every day, and I really mean that. I mean, I'm actually humbled by it, and, and, I don't, and I know that sounds, whenever someone says they're humbled by it, it's like, yeah, you're not really, no, I really, I'm, every day I walk around, and I just kind of like, I'm, I'm amazed at how much we've been able to build up the show and, and how many uh, wonderful people appreciate what the, the work that Mark and I do here every day in the Freedom Hut. I have producer Nick, who you, never get, you guys never get to hear from, but he helps us on the, uh, on the first, which is the video uh, version of the show that we do every day. 
Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't. T- I don't take cheap shots. Period. But I definitely don't take cheap shots at fellow conservatives. I wish I could say that about everybody on the right, but you can't. Some people are uh, petty, greedy, and nasty. And I'll just leave it there. But thank you for calling in. Okay, now we get into the written roll call to finish things up. Make sure you go to bucksexton.com and please, please check out our Buck Brief that we post every day on Facebook. And the single most helpful thing, if you like the Buck Brief, which is kind of a, it's like if we took this show and did it in four minutes or less, which we do every day now, uh, well, Monday through Friday. And if you think that's a cool idea, the best thing you can do is to share it to your Facebook page. That's how, that's how you really help with things. And obviously to watch it on your, on your own, which we appreciate very much. And go to bucksexton.com. We've got uh, an up, some upgrades coming to the site this weekend. We are doing cool things. And it's rainy and there's no snow princess in town this weekend. So maybe, I don't know, maybe there'll be a history podcast that happens. You never know. I know the Zero team. chance. I just yeah. want to prepare the listeners. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Don't listen to it. You never, you never know. Uh, all right, we have the written, we have the written stuff here. Where did it go? Oh, where did what the? Where's the written? Oh no, you did, you did send it to me. I was gonna give you crap, but you actually did send it to me. Okay, Susie writes, "Hey Buck from Alaska. Hello. I have an idea to get the left to get on board with opening all the schools in the fall. We just need Trump to go pro homeschooling." And reallocate federal funding and expand homeschooling programs, including programs with faith-based, cur- faith-based curriculum. Then the left will have to decide which it hates more, COVID-19 cases or religious stay-at-home moms. I am not a homeschooling mom, but many of my close friends are, and the leftists have zero love for them. In my experience, modern feminism or leftism doesn't have any room for women who support traditional Christian values, family values, and many families homeschool to reinforce traditional family values in the next generation. Very, uh, very thoughtful and eloquent, Susie. Thank you. Um, from up in Alaska. Very cool. I watched the movie uh, The Gray recently, uh, which is about wolves chasing Liam Neeson, who randomly, there's some British guy hanging out with all these other guys in Alaska who are clearly American, but a uh, side note. Um, I think actually he's Irish. Is he Irish? I think he's Irish. Uh, but they're chased by CGI wolves. And even though it's ridiculous and wolves, I don't think have ever, I don't think there's ever a documented case of healthy wolves eating a human being in recorded history. But man, it's a fun, it's a fun watch anyway. It's like, it's all cold and the wolves are scary. I digress. Frank. So I was listening to today's podcast and one of the listeners wrote in that during roll call, he had a friend who went in to get tested for COVID-19, but from what you read, it sounded like his friend was never actually tested, yet still received a call testing that he stated positive. You then went on to correctly talk about how the entire tracing thing is ridiculous because these tests are taking three to four days to come back. I think you may have missed the point, though, which is that this guy's friend never actually took a test but received a call that he tested positive anyway, as if they're inflating the numbers by having people sign up for tests, but they hope they don't get added into the assumed positive category. Anyway... You and producer Mark are literally the most entertaining duo on talk radio. Thank you so much for what you do. Oh, thank you, man. That's very nice. We appreciate that. Well, I cannot grow a beard. I am a 37-year-old gray beard, fiercely independent conservative, Marvel and DC loving, Star Trek and Star Wars fan, black American millennial whose favorite TV show of all time is proudly stated as friends, hands down, period. I love passing the buck and do it often. People enjoy your chill attitude and welcoming vibes. Keep up the good work. Shields high. Frank, I feel like we're going to be buddies, man. Thank you so much. Frank sounds awesome. I, I got I to gotta get my PS4, which I'm thinking about doing, so I can play Call of Duty, and then Frank and I can play on the same Call of Duty team. Except uh, his favorite TV show of all time is just a bad show. Frank, you write into producer Mark, and you tell him to lock that up, all right? You tell him to lock it up with his And, and it's not because it's getting canceled about recently. Friends. I want to point that out there. It's just a bad show in general. I, I, I don't even know what to say. Seriously? Poor writing. Uh, very cliche. You don't like Joey Tribbione? I feel like Joey Tribbione and you were like high school friends. You, you, don't, I like, you don't I like George Costanza. Oh, that does not. That is not a surprise. Uh, Maureen, you guys are the best. Two of my favorite people. Love your podcast and website. I sure noticed producer Mark's extra saltiness on Tuesday. I think he wants us all to know he's not cuddly like you said he was. He didn't like that very much. 
So is Fauci the fraud an idiot, or is he just being deliberately obtuse so as to perpetuate the DNC agenda? The spike in COVID is not due to responsible reopenings, as he claimed. It's due to protesters, rioters, looters, and over a million tests a day being done, which naturally shows more cases. Cases aren't deaths. Thanks for all you do. Your hard work and efforts haven't gone on notice. It's appreciated far more than you know. Well, we really appreciate that. Thank you so much for the kind words. Everybody, that's going to be the show for this kind of rainy and sad Friday from New York City. Hopefully it's nice wherever you are. Talk to you all Monday. Have a great weekend. Make sure you pass the buck when you can. Shields high.